The WNBA season starts tonight. It's Friday, May 19th. I'm senior writer Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. We have a great interview with one of the WNBA's biggest stars coming up in just a minute. First, let's hit some news. Major League Soccer unveiled its 30th team on Thursday. The team will begin playing in 2025 in San Diego at Snapdragon Stadium, which it will share with the NWSL San Diego Wave. The team will be owned by Egyptian businessman Mohamed Mansour, who said at the press conference announcing the team that this was like 1,000 birthdays coming together. The team will also be owned by the Sikwan tribe, which is believed to have a 12,000-year history in the area and owns a successful casino resort east of San Diego. And Padres third baseman Manny Machado will also be part of the ownership group. Someone in the crowd shouted MVP when Machado was getting up on stage, which is not an accurate description of his season so far. The team reportedly paid $500 million to MLS as an expansion fee. The previous record was $325 million set by Charlotte in 2019. That is the clearest indicator yet that people see a huge future for soccer in the U.S. Last thing on this, the team does not have a name yet. I'm thinking it should somehow work with the wave. Soccer teams in the same city often have names that play off of each other, which I think is cool. And I think there are a lot of directions you can go with the wave. If you have ideas, send them my way at today at frontofficesports.com. Looking elsewhere, YouTube TV ran into technical problems near the end of the Celtics Heat conference final game on Wednesday, with some viewers saying they saw an error message and others saying they saw the same commercial over and over. That's not a headline YouTube was looking to make a few months before they take over NFL Sunday ticket. And the Arizona Coyotes will play at least one more year at Arizona State University after failing to win a public vote on what would have been a new arena and entertainment district. My guess is that they work out a deal with the Phoenix Suns to play at Footprint Center. But as we discussed yesterday, there are a lot of cities that would like to have an NHL team. Up next, they spoke to WNBA superstar Brianna Stewart. Stewie is a former Rookie of the Year, MVP, two-time champion and finals MVP, and now she is headed from the Seattle Storm to the New York Liberty. She also just unveiled her second sneaker with Puma. We talked about all of that and the reforms she would like to see in the WNBA. We'll have that conversation right after this. Here's what's trending now. You can defer payments of a full NetSuite implementation for six months. 33,000 companies have already upgraded to NetSuite, gaining visibility and control over their financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. Everything they need to reduce manual processes, boost efficiency, build forecasts, and increase productivity. Whether your business generates millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, take advantage of this special financing offer of no payments or interest for six months at netsuite.com slash frontoffice. That's netsuite.com slash front office. All right. I am very excited to be joined by Brianna Stewart of the New York Liberty, newly of the New York Liberty. Welcome, Brianna. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So uh, you spent your entire WNBA career with Seattle, moving to New York now. How's the transition been? The transition has been interesting. Um, it's been great to, to kind of make the change from, from Seattle to New York, but I'm still adjusting in, in a lot of ways, you know, realizing when I have a New York shirt on that I'm with the New York Liberty. When I'm in the New York Liberty group chat, that's because that's the team I'm on. And when people are asking me which what team I'm on, I, I start with an S and then I say New York. And it's just, it's just a little bit of, of kind of figuring it out right now, but I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, and and you're from Syracuse, New York, right? Did you get into the city at all when you were growing up? Yeah, I was um, in the city a lot, especially as I was really becoming a uh, more known basketball player during you know my high school career and things like that. Um, so I was around there a lot with AAU, with high school tournaments, and then obviously going to UConn. Um, so a lot of ties there, and it just it just feels comfortable. It just feels good to be back and I'm really excited to see what's going to happen this summer with the Liberty and how the fans are going to kind of get behind us. Yeah. And, and it's the preseason now. Of, are you feeling like you're gelling with your, your new team? Yeah, definitely. I think that, you know, I've been having a little bit of a slow ramp up because I just got back from Turkey about two weeks ago. So I wanted to make sure I had the time off, but also want to get back with the team because it is a new team. Um, but 
we're having a lot of fun together and you know it's it's an interesting group of returners to the liberty new players rookies players who have won players who haven't um so we're all just trying to help each other excel this process and were you playing in turkey yeah i was playing for fenerbahce okay yeah and that's is that a regular part of your off season or i guess it's not really off season if you're playing but your wnba off season you, you travel every year yeah usually you know the lifestyle of a women's basketball player, WNBA players, uh, the the off season is really not a thing. You're just kind of going from one country to the next. And um, I've been fortunate to play overseas in, in numerous countries and, you know, just get a different experience and also continue to be playing year round. Yeah. Yeah. I gotcha. So uh, your, your new sneaker, the Stewie 2 is coming out, You're working with Puma. I actually want to jump to last year um, when the first Stewie came out. It was the first women's signature shoe, WNBA signature shoe in 10 years. What did it mean for you to produce that and then to see it out in the world? Yeah, to have the the first signature shoe, um, signature women's basketball shoe in 10 years, it was uh, really a bittersweet moment. And, you know, something that it was like, wow, this is amazing. And look at the company that I'm in and to be the 10th one, but also <clears throat> kind of felt like it's long overdue. You know, there should have been way more signature shoes. So uh, <clears throat> happy to kind of get it back started again, get get women's signatures back on the table. Now there's a few more coming behind me. Um, and it's it's what the the women's basketball world needs. It, it's what we need to kind of continue to bridge the gap between the fan and the player and, um, you know, have young kids and young girls be able to go into a store like, Dick's Sporting Goods or shop online at Puma and be like, I want the Stewies. And and now they can get them. Yeah. And talk to me a little bit about kind of how, how sneakers play into that culture. Because I think like everyone knows like the Air Jordans, but like there's this mm-hmm. whole world of, yeah. of, of you know, sneaker heads and just people who, you know, like want the, the sneaker of their favorite athlete. So, yeah. How do you feel like you are adding to that that sneaker culture? I think I'm I'm adding to the sneaker culture because I'm giving a, a perspective that we haven't seen in a while. And, you know, like you said, it's like, you know, all these shoes, if you're a sneaker head, you're aware of, you know, what's coming out and what's this and what's that. And, you know, now to be able to have that, not only in the, the NBA world and on the men's side when, you know, people want LeBrons or uh, KDs or things like that, now people can come into the, the, the women's basketball, the WNBA and be like, you know, I want Stewie's. And, and also kind of see the progression of my one to my two to hopefully my, I don't know, hopefully there's not a limit on how many how many shoes I'll have. Yeah, yeah. And, and talk to me a bit about the design process. So what is it like to, you know, go from like saying like, yes, let's do a shoe together with Puma to actually, um, you know, creating it and designing it? Yeah, the design process is wild. Um and Puma, you know, really appreciate them because they let me be hands on from the start. So in 2021, we had a meeting in Indianapolis and I remember walking into one of these conference rooms and it was just like, you know, papers everywhere, shoes everywhere, like fabrics, cushions, whatever, all the things um, to make sure that the shoe that we were creating was exactly what I, I kind of wanted. So doing that with the one creating a base and then evolving to the two uh, making sure that we're updating all the latest technology with the nitro foam, with the um, from the performance side of things, um, it's it's been great and it's been really exciting. And you know, with the ruby dropping, it's it's a shoe that I knew that I wanted since I knew I was going to get a signature, and since I knew um, my daughter Ruby was kind of coming into this world. And um, I've been I've been holding that one in my back pocket for a while, so I'm happy that it's it's here and it's out and people are going to be able to get it soon. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what did you want in, in the design of uh, for the one and then evolving into the two? I wanted a shoe that I could be my best in and I could be comfortable in. And with that, it's, you know, taking into consideration the fact that uh, I'm usually in low tops because of my Achilles, because I don't want my scar to be rubbing with the shoe. I need a little bit of extra cushion on the back just because um, I still, from the Achilles, from, from that injury and things like that. But also I want it to be a shoe where, you know, it, it can be versatile like me, you know, it can be for a post player. It can be for a guard. It can be for someone who's, you know, on the block or coming off a curl screen. Um, 
so I, I wanted a shoe that, that really kind of embodied me. And, and that's what we did with the Stewie one. And then um, from the design process of the two with the Ruby, um, you know, I knew that from the color perspective, I wanted the shoe to be all one color, all Ruby. Um, and then putting little ties in there to, to kind of connect with her with, you know, her name, her birthday, um, this logo, having the rubies coming out of uh, my logo, um, simple things like that. And, you know, I'm really excited for it. Yeah, yeah, that's very cool. Um, how is it? I mean, I, it's almost like, <laughs> I feel like it's almost a too obvious a question or, or whatever, but I'm just, I'm just curious, like, how, how's it been like, you know, being a professional athlete? with a very young daughter who's what, like two now or something, something like that. Almost two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. How, how's that impacted? <laughs> I mean, it, it impacts every single part of your life, but yeah, for you, how's it, how's that impacted you? Oh my gosh. Well, uh, well, my perspective on life kind of changed a little bit after coming back from an Achilles injury, you know, but my perspective on life definitely changed a lot more after having a daughter. Um, but it's, it's been something, you know, it's the, the greatest thing that, that has happened to me to be able to have, you know, a little one around us, around my wife and I, and uh, be able to experience everything that I'm experiencing. I think that, you know, that's really the thing is I want her to see that, you know, in this world now, if you're a athlete, a female athlete or whatever, um, that you can do whatever you want in life and to have her be surrounded by many amazing uh, role models is is kind of our goal and um you know for 21 months she's she's done a lot and hopefully she'll do a lot more but um uh, it's it's inspiring and also you know makes you realize the the life of a, a working mom is is not easy but but being able to do it and being able to kind of be my best at both is is my goal yeah 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 it's fantastic um, speaking of the, the role models, she'll see as she's growing up, you, you're heading, heading into your, your seventh season, the WNBA. Um, how have you seen that league evolve over the last six, seven years? The league has evolved tremendously. I think, you know, when I first got into the WNBA, uh, just speaking from like the business side of things, we, we have a new CBA where it's obviously more money for the players, but also more benefits for moms, more benefits just for, uh, people to can continue to kind of expand on their life after basketball. Um, and I think, you know, the same of what you've seen a lot in college basketball and women's college basketball this, this past year is, you know, more eyes, more viewership, more, more interest in what we're doing and a bigger platform. And come what comes with that is the ability for us to continue to kind of get better and show what we can do and show that, you know, people have been missing out on this for a while, but but now we're happy to have more people behind us. And uh, do you feel like the league and the players are, are all pushing in the same direction here in terms of the, the growth and progression of the league? Yeah, I think <clears throat> we're, we're definitely kind of pushing in the same direction. I think there's sometimes a little bit of hiccups along the way, you know, charter situation, stuff like that, that we, we kind of go back and forth with. But, um, you know, our goal is, is to make this the, the best it can possibly be. And I think we're, we're nowhere near scratching the surface of where this league can become and, um, that's that's what's most exciting but you know for <clears throat> for example i said this the other day it's like the fact that women's sports receives less than five percent of of sports media coverage is is kind of crazy and hopefully we'll get to this point where you know we're competing for the same things but we're not having to fight over this five percent we'll have more than than that and are there beyond just growth you know getting more eyeballs more money into the the sport are there specific goals or specific milestones whether it's charter whether it's overseas play or what, whatever it is where when you see that you'd be like okay we've really gotten somewhere now yeah i think you could you could kind of have like a lot of different buckets behind this i think you know one of the biggest things is um we have the tv deal coming up that is where we should really kind of be able to capitalize on things and and really make a lot of change in and you know our value and uh, salaries and, and things like that, but also charters. Uh, I, you know, it shouldn't be something that we ha we constantly have to explain our why of, of why we need it. You know, we need it because we want to be able to perform the best we possibly can. And like I said, I had a travel issue yesterday. We got to, to Vegas at two in the morning and we're in preseason now, but it's like these hiccups that we have, um, you know, aren't going to help us be our best. Um, and then continuing with the benefits, continuing with the, the media coverage and also 
hopefully expansion. I feel like there's a lot of things, a lot of directions that I could go with this and, and I don't want to ramble, but um, you'll see in the next couple of, of days and weeks that many players are going to get cut and get waived because there is not a lot of roster spots, especially for the new ones coming in. Um, and we need to, to kind of be able to make space and expand the game because they're coming and they, yeah, they might need to develop, but they also have a fan base and they're willing to learn. Yeah. Yeah. And so the league, I think is, you know, probably going to add two teams in the next, next couple of years or something like that. Um, there's also the issue of the roster sizes themselves. Commissioner says they're the right size right now. Do you agree that, that the rosters themselves are a good size? Um, I, I don't, I think that the roster sizes <clears throat> for, so the roster that you need for a game, the 12, I'm I'm okay with that. But I think that there should be able to be like two developmental spots, you know, where in the NBA where you have this two-way player, you know, we don't have a G League um, or anything like that, but we should be able to to kind of develop these, these younger players, these rookies who have less than three years of service um, <clears throat> and then slide them in when we need a hardship player, when we have an injury and things like that. So we're not constantly just going and finding someone and grabbing them and trying to show them plays in, in the matter of five seconds. Um, and also, it's 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 not tarnishing a young player's new career so early. You know, it's giving them a, a moment and an opportunity to to get better, to develop, to understand what's the difference between college and WNBA because there is a difference. And this three weeks that you have between the end of your college season and the start of your WNBA isn't going to help you get up to speed that quickly. Do you think there's room for something like a G League for women's basketball? I think eventually, I think eventually there there could be room for a G League. I think that, you know, <clears throat> it, it really depends on what happens with this TV deal, what happens with, with overseas. Um, if we can kind of supplement the fact where there's a league playing, maybe it's not going to be as many teams as we have in the WNBA, but it's going to have people playing that are constantly going to develop and get ready. Um, there's, there's many avenues where we could kind of take a, a deeper dive and look into and uh, it's the exciting process, but also it's the growing pains, I guess. Yeah, right. And it's high stakes, too, because <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, especially the TV deal, you're, that deal is going to be like one thing or one set of deals, and that's going to be the deal for a little while. And so that's that's going to really be a, a shaping force. Uh, just before I let you go, what's like one aspiration of yours outside of basketball that is just sort of like a, a personal thing, whether it's travel, a hobby or wh- whatever it is? Uh, what, what's or if there is anything other than basketball right now. Oh, um, one of my, I guess one of my aspirations other than basketball is uh, <clears throat> to to kind of be able to travel and travel with a more leisure lifestyle and, and more leisure approach. You know, maybe the next time that I go overseas, it won't be to play. It'll be just to visit, um, spend more time about, around my family and be home for the holidays. Yeah, very cool. All right, Brianna Stewart, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank you so much. That's it for today. Miami fans, I don't know what kind of occult magic you performed to get both of your number eight seed teams in the semifinals of the NBA and NHL playoffs, but please either stop or teach the rest of us how that works. I was just thinking about that and thought, well, at least the Marlins are bad, right? And it turns out that's wrong too. They're in second place in the NL East. Time to dial it back, guys. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your weekend, and we will see you Monday. Monday.